Hi, and welcome to our discussion of biotechnology tools here in our information unit. You definitely want to make sure that you have a very good understanding of how DNA works in cells before you watch this video. If not, you're probably going to be lost pretty early on. I decided to start out this video with a picture of these mice who've been genetically engineered to glow green under UV light. This was accomplished by engineering the gene for green fluorescent protein into the genomes of these mice. Green fluorescent protein is not naturally found in the mouse genome. It was actually isolated from this species of jellyfish and then engineered into the genome of these mice specifically. That's just one example of the kinds of things that we can do in biotechnology. But the purpose of this video is really to investigate how biotechnology works. We're going to look at four different examples of biotechnology in this video. We're going to look at restriction enzymes, gel electrophoresis, the polymerase chain reaction, and DNA sequencing. Let's stop before we go any further to note that this is not an exhaustive list of biotechnology. Biotechnology changes very, very rapidly, and I can almost guarantee you that pretty much everything we're talking about in this video is already out of date in terms of how working biotechnologists accomplish a lot of the purposes that we're going to talk about in this video. We should also pause to note that we're really entering the realm of engineering here, and that engineering is a related but different field than science. Science is generally involved in trying to find the answers to questions. Engineering is generally involved with trying to find the solutions to problems. Biotechnology enables the field of genetic engineering, which is, as you could guess, trying to find solutions to various problems by using tools and techniques that, that are based upon our understanding of genetics. Let's start with restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes are enzymes that cut DNA molecules, but they don't just cut DNA anywhere. That wouldn't be particularly useful. Restriction enzymes cut DNA at specific sequences, what are known as restriction sites. The image here shows you the ECO-R1 restriction enzyme. It recognizes the sequence GAA-TTC, and it cuts that sequence in half, separating the DNA molecule at that site into two separate DNA molecules. This is just one example of a restriction enzyme. There are hundreds and hundreds of restriction enzymes, each of which recognizes and cuts at different restriction sites. All of these enzymes are available for genetic engineers to use when they need to manipulate DNA molecules. Of course, engineers didn't create restriction enzymes. Restriction enzymes were first discovered in bacterial cells. One of the major threats to bacterial cells are bacteriophages, or viruses that infect them and destroy their genomes. Restriction enzymes serve as a kind of bacterial immune system so that when bacteriophages infect a cell, the restriction enzymes can find sequences in that bacterial phage genome that they recognize and cut the genome into segments so that the DNA is no longer infective. Of course, that's only half of it. What's to prevent the restriction enzyme from also cutting the host cell's genome at the same restriction site? The answer are DNA methyltransferases, which are enzymes that go through the bacterial genome and add methyl groups to the bases throughout the genome, thereby tagging them as belonging to the bacterial cell. Restriction enzymes cannot cut methylated DNA. They can only cut unmethylated DNA. As long as the methyltransferase system is working correctly inside of the cell, the only unmethylated DNA that's going to be found by restriction enzymes is DNA that should not be there and so it'll get cut. Restriction enzymes have a ton of uses in genetic engineering. In order to be able to manipulate DNA sequences, you frequently have to be able to isolate those sequences from a bunch of other DNA. In this image, we see a DNA sequence of interest within a larger genome. If we know that there's a restriction site on both sides of this sequence of interest, we can treat the DNA with the restriction enzyme and cut the sequence of interest away from the rest of the genome. Once we've isolated the sequence, we can do what we want with it. Another benefit of using restriction enzymes is that if you use the same restriction enzyme on two different pieces of DNA, the ends of the restriction enzyme can generate overhanging bases that are complementary, so that when you put those two molecules together, they will spontaneously align according to the base pairing rules, and we can then ligate the bases together in order to make the phosphodiester bonds that are needed to, to permanently join the two different DNA molecules together. This leads to production of customized recombinant DNA molecules. DNA molecules that are composed of source molecules from multiple different organisms. To go back to our green mouse example, one of the steps in being able to generate our GFP mouse was to isolate the gene for GFP from the jellyfish that it naturally occurs in and then recombine it into a molecule that could hold that sequence and deliver it into the mice. 
The next big tool that we're gonna look at is gel electrophoresis, which is a way of separating out DNA molecules based on their size. This picture shows a gel electrophoresis setup. We have a power source up at the top, we have a gel box, and in that gel box, so we would have a rectangular gel made out of agarose that we would use for the process of gel electrophoresis. At the macro level, the gel basically looks like any other gel that you've ever seen in your life. It's a translucent blue color. It's made out of agarose, which is a polysaccharide, so it's different from jello in that sense, as jello is made out of protein, but it's not that much different. If we look at it microscopically, we'll see that the gel is actually a matrix of microscopic tunnels and holes that the DNA moves through. After the DNA moves through the gel, the results are usually visualized by staining the gel with a chemical that binds to the DNA, and then, and then looking at that under a UV light. And that'll lead to a picture that looks like this, where the bands that you see are collections of DNA molecules of different sizes that have moved to different places in the gel. Let's take a look at how gel electrophoresis works. This is a cartoon blow up of our agarose gel. The holes at the top are known as wells, and that's where we'll put our solutions of DNA molecules. Once we've done that, we're going to apply an electrical current to our gel. This is what's going to cause the DNA to move through the gel. DNA is negatively charged, so by putting our negative electrodes up by the well and our positive electrodes down at the bottom away from the wells, when we turn on the current, the DNA will begin migrating through the gel matrix. And it will migrate through the gel matrix as a function of its size, with similarly sized pieces of DNA traveling to similar rates. Smaller pieces of DNA will move further through the gel as they'll have an easier time getting through the matrix of holes. Larger pieces will not move as much. So when we look at a gel, the pieces closest to the wells are the largest pieces and the pieces furthest away are the smaller pieces. There are different ways to determine the size of the pieces of DNA that have moved through a gel. The modern way is to use a marker, which is a solution of DNA molecules of known sizes. If we know the sizes of the marker fragments, we can use them to determine the sizes of the other fragments in the gel. Bands that have traveled to the same place in their wells as the different marker fragments have will be similar in size to the fragments in the marker lanes. Just like restriction enzymes, separating out DNA molecules based on their size has a lot of different applications in the field of genetic engineering. If we wanna be able to isolate a fragment of a specific size, running a solution that contains those fragments on the gel helps to separate out those size fragments from the rest of them. But gel electrophoresis is also widely used in identification based on DNA sequences. In this experiment, intestinal bacteria was isolated before treatment with antibiotics, which occurred on day five, and then after treatment with antibiotics. If you look at the pattern in the gel for individual B, you can see that treatment with antibiotics had a major effect on the types of bacteria that were present in their intestines after treatment with antibiotics. This is what we mean when we say that gels are very useful for identification. By correlating fragments of certain sizes to individual organisms in this case, you can see changes that happen over time that you wouldn't be able to see otherwise. The other place where gel electrophoresis is widely used is in forensics. This image is a representation of DNA evidence used in a criminal case. Going across from the left to the right, what we can see are some size markers, control DNA that was isolated from the person running the gel, DNA that was isolated from the victim, DNA that was left on the victim from the perpetrator of the crime, DNA from the suspect, and DNA from other evidence that was recovered. You can see that the banding patterns for the DNA left on the victim, the DNA of the suspect, and the evidence all match, which supports the conclusion that the suspect was the one who committed this particular crime. Though, of course, it's by no means conclusive in and of itself in this one image. Actual trials will look at multiple different locations in the genome in order to establish an increasing likelihood that the suspect did or did not commit the crime. Similar identification approaches are used for paternity testing or for determining if somebody is entitled to inheritance. There are a lot of different applications of gel electrophoresis in this area. The third tool that we're gonna look at is the polymerase chain reaction, which is a way to copy DNA molecules in test tubes. This image shows a thermal cycler, which is the device that is used in order to allow this to happen. And we see an image here of a special kind of polymerase known as TAC polymerase, which is what makes the polymerase chain reaction or PCR possible. It was understood from the 1970s that it was theoretically possible to carry out DNA replication in a test tube, but it wasn't until the 1980s that it became commercially viable. The key for PCR is a special DNA polymerase that's isolated from extremophile bacteria that were first found in the hot springs at Yellowstone National Park, Thermus aquaticus. That polymerase, which we call TAC polymerase, makes PCR possible because the temperatures at which PCR occurs are high enough that most polymerases, like ours, would be irreparably denatured during the process. Everything happens in these tiny little tubes that are put into a thermal cycler, which is a device that quickly cycles through three different temperatures for the three different steps of PCR. Let's take a look at how this works. 
The first step is denaturation. The strands of the target DNA molecule, the one we want to copy, are heated up to a very high temperature of 94 to 96 degrees Celsius. This causes the DNA to denature and for the two strands of the helix to separate. It's also the step that would totally fry a non-extremophile polymerase. In the second step, forward and reverse primers, which are small complementary sequences that have been created in the lab and bracket the sequence of interest, are exposed to the denatured DNA and attached to the target strand that we want to copy. This second step, the annealing step, happens at a temperature of 68 degrees Celsius. After this step, we have two separated strands of DNA with the forward and reverse primers attached to the start and the stop of the sequence that we want to copy. In step three, TAC polymerase is going to attach to the primer and then replicate the target sequence. It will continue to do this until it gets to the end of the target sequence, at which point it will simply fall off of the molecule. The elongation step happens at a temperature of 72 degrees Celsius, which is also much hotter than most normal polymerases can withstand, but is the normal working temperature for TAC polymerase. If we take a moment and look at the math involved in PCR, we can start to understand just how powerful it is. Every round of PCR that we do causes the number of target sequence copies of DNA to double. A typical PCR runs for 30 cycles and takes place over the span of an evening or so. Over that span of time, we'll make two to the 30 copies, which is more than 1 billion copies of our target DNA molecule. This is an incredibly powerful thing that happens in a pretty tiny test tube over the span of a couple of hours. Just like our other tools, PCR has wide ranging uses in biotechnology. Almost every biotechnological application benefits from having a lot of copies of a target DNA sequence. Forensic analysis generally can't work unless the fragments are amplified through PCR first. The example that you see here is an example of an experiment that looked at genetic modification in corn chips. DNA in the grain from the corn chips was amplified through PCR using primers that were correlated to genetic engineering. When the results are run on the gel, we can see a band characteristic of the cauliflower mosaic virus 35 promoter, which is a common promoter used in the genetic engineering of plants, thereby suggesting that the grain that these snack chips were made of was genetically engineered. The last tool that we're going to talk about is DNA sequencing, which we use to read DNA. This technology was originally developed by Frederick Sanger, who won his second Nobel Prize in chemistry for this result, which is why he gets his own picture in this presentation. DNA sequencing uses chain terminating dideoxynucleotides, or DDNTPs. Modern approaches also use nucleotides that have been modified in other ways. But the key here is to use a nucleotide that has a specific and identifiable tag. In the case of dideoxynucleotides, it's missing the three prime hydroxyl group. These tags are then visualized in order to determine the sequence of the molecule in question. In order to sequence a molecule of DNA, you need a primer and you need a target sequence, you need polymerase, and you need regular nucleotides, and you also need the modified dideoxynucleotides. All of these are placed into a common reaction vessel where replication is allowed to occur. As replication occurs, every time the modified nucleotides are incorporated into the strand, replication will cease. The results are then visualized in order to determine the sequence of the molecule. In this case, going from the top down, we can read the sequence as G-G-T-C-A-T-A-G. Sanger's original approach used a special kind of gel made out of polyacrylamide, which visualized one base pair differences in four different lanes, one for each of the different bases in the DNA molecule. The sequences would then be read from the bottom up by just looking at the position of the bands in the lanes. Modern sequencing uses computers to take care of all of this. The dideoxynucleotides are tagged with molecules that fluoresce when they're exposed to a laser, which is then interpreted by the computer. Modern approaches have a lot of advantages over the old school approach. You can do it in one tube instead of in four tubes. It takes hours instead of days. And computers are much better at reading sequence information than people are. What you see at the bottom is a computer generated readout of the sequence information of the piece of DNA. And of course, modern approaches are much cheaper than older approaches were. Entire genomes can be sequenced over the span of a couple of hours. This would not be possible without the efficiencies that have developed as we moved away from the old school approach to modern sequencing approaches. In fact, the cost of sequencing an entire human genome has dropped 100,000 fold over the last 15 years or so. The types of science that cheap sequencing has enabled has exploded over that same span of time. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of biotechnology tools. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can explain how each of the tools discussed in this video work. Make sure you can describe some of the uses of each of the tools that we've talked about. And finally, make sure that you can connect the discovery of mechanisms that already exist in biological systems, for instance, restriction enzymes or TAC polymerase, to biotechnology applications. One of the fundamental things about biotechnology and genetic engineering is taking what we find in nature and using it for our own purpose.
If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down the questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching the video. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.